Hey, yeah, so I wanted to talk about uh, SVG reality, and it might not be a famous Belgian, um, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll make it entertaining, I guess. So I want to talk about this problem. Um, and some of you are a bit older, like myself, would remember that the web used to be 1024, and everyone was just doing 1024. And the big question was, do you do 960 pixels wide, 980, maybe 1,000 if you're like kind of a rebel? 960, there you go, there you go. Just uh, so, but sort of things have changed a lot. And we've gone from desktop computers with CRT monitors that just uh, all out with the same uh, number of pixels to what is going on with these pixels. Um, devices have gone totally crazy. We've got every single re resolution you can imagine. Um, not only that, pixels have now gone crazy and have more pixels in them, however that works. Uh, so I think, I, think, I think we need better tools, better languages, and um, I think what we really have, have, um, have to work with is something that fits these new technologies. So, uh, we, need, we need software, we need languages that fit the hardware that we've created. Um, we need something that can adapt to the picture. Um, another thing that we've come up with, like I said, is uh, high DPI. So that means we've got more than one device pixel per CSS pixel or per logical pixel. Um, and suddenly all of our assets that are meant to look beautiful and high resolution suddenly look not so high resolution anymore. Um, even though they're the same assets, somehow people have sort of gotten used to expecting super crisp text. And if you have super crisp text, why do the pictures not look as sharp? Um, sure, you could just feed massive assets down the pipe is quadruple the bandwidth that you're going to use, or, or, or almost quadruple. Um, but it's not very uh, sustainable, for, and it's not really necessary for a lot of use cases. Um, I think it's better to use a format that stretches. Um, and when you think of that, we've kind of had these formats for a long, long time. We've, you know, we've thankfully gotten rid of Flash, which was kind of like that, but not really the best tool for the job, for other reasons. Um, we've had things like uh, SVG for quite a while. Now, CSS also has a lot of ways to do that. CSS a lot of, has a lot of ways, and here's, here's one site called you know, OneDiv.com, I'm sure a lot of you know it, um, which turns a single div into uh, pretty much any kind of icon using a variety of ridiculous hacks, uh, using you know, pseudo elements and a lot of border, uh, you know, border tricks, background tricks, gradients all over the place. Uh, but I, I think that's pretty much insane. I don't think we should code like that. I think it's really cool to be clever enough to come up with those things, but we should not be using that. It's not good software engineering. Um, I feel like we're kind of doing, we're kind of doing Rube Goldberg uh, CSS. Uh, if you're familiar with that, it's the concept of having an extremely fragile machine that does something really intricate. It's completely unmaintainable, but it looks pretty sweet. And it's very entertaining and it makes you feel really smart when you like uh, put it all together. Um, but it's crazy, right? So instead of that, why don't we use something like SVG, scalable vector graphics, that are pretty much designed to solve this problem and have done so for you know, a decade now or more. Uh, but we haven't really been using them pretty well, at least I haven't. So I wanted to share a little bit of what I've you know, uh, discovered in, uh, in, in having another look at them in the last like, year or so. Um, I think SVG uh, is, a, is, one, is one standard that's extremely huge, and everyone sort of underestimates it. I think it can do a lot of things that people don't expect. And I think going forward with sort of where the future of front-end development is heading, when you think of um, web components, um, when, you, when you think of you know, ECMAScript 6, all the modularization that our applications are going to undergo, um, when you think of the, future, like, you know, the current awesome stuff that we have in CSS3 and uh, where CSS level 4 and other, you know, where, where all that's going. I think SVG is ideally placed to take advantage of all of that and become a core part of our application architecture. So we're going to be coding SVG just like we are coding CSS today, which is something that maybe 10 years ago we wouldn't have you know, thought that was more than a joke because uh, we were doing everything in HTML and some JavaScript. And then sort of JavaScript went and became totally crazy huge and awesome. But it's actually a very simple language compared to something like SVG, which supports a lot, lot more. 
It's kind of like HTML5. If you ever looked at the HTML5 spec, your scroll bar was really small. SVG is sort of something like that, except even more. Um, and I don't think we can cover like, nearly the entire standard today. But I want to just okay, introduce you and tell you guys that, and then maybe, that this is an amazing uh, technology that's available in a lot of browsers. Um, and we should take advantage of it. It's not my intention to talk too much about the um, browser support, because I think almost everything you look at is going to be broken in some browsers, and that's kind of fine. You know, we're looking we're here because we're focused on you know the future, the, the lessons we learn here from all the amazing speakers today are things that are going to you know, matter to us for years to come. And so I don't want to focus on like legacy support. I think most of the stuff that even isn't working right now in browsers will have shims for it, you know, either already available or coming out soon, um, to sort of let us play with it and see where this is all heading. So I want to get away from this, which to me is how I sort of wanted to present the idea that this tiger is SVG as it was 10 or more years ago. And I've seen this picture again and again and again. And I want to get away from this pointless uh, use of SVG and to something that can help us build applications and be cool like him, like the call of guys. So, um, who am I? Uh, my name is Sebastian. I'm, uh, I'm a front end developer. I, I live in Singapore. I work at a company called Co Founders uh, with a lot of startups, and I just basically do front end development uh, all the time. Uh, I work on a number of projects, so I won't bore you with all of that. So, Without further ado, let us talk about oh, some of the community stuff that we have here as well. Uh, some actually probably uh, this picture contains probably a lot of guys, uh, a lot of people here uh, present right now. This was a few days ago. Uh, there's a bit really vibrant uh, community of front end developers in Singapore, and I just wanted to sort of uh, share it out with everyone. Um, I think it's amazing uh, the way that developers have sort of gotten together in Singapore uh, across all platforms and all languages. There's, uh, as you can see with the Dev Fest, there's something amazing going on here every single day. Um, there's something for everyone, really. And it's just every single year, I've been here for four years now, every single year, it pretty much doubles in size. I think it's wonderful. And I, I look forward to all future JS comps and CSS comps. So, if we can look at SVG, um, coming from, you know, we're at CSS comp. We're all front-end developers. Well, most of us are primarily front-end developers, I guess. Um, it's actually very similar in what we're used to. So you know, it, I hope you can see that. So it basically, it supports you know like uh, device-independent uh, pixels, uh, animations. It's got hardware acceleration, you know, varying browser support, but some you know, some amazing performance is possible. Uh, blending modes are really interesting. They're you know you might not you might not be used to blending modes in CSS, but they're kind of there. Um, it's Basically, what lets us do Photoshop kind of effects with layers between uh, HTML elements or SVG elements. Um, you know, you can make it responsive. You can use your uh, WebKit inspector or Firebug or other tools to debug things. It's very, very easy to do. Um, you've got uh, you know filters. It has a DOM API just like you're, we're used to with um, HTML. So it makes it very uh, powerful to, to to build on top of it using you know logic to create elements to you know, drive changes. Um, there's a lot of libraries that basically built on top of that that make that very easy. Um, it's got scripting embedded. So not only can you access the, your SVG structures um, with scripts, with external scripts, and manipulate the, uh, the, the DOM, the SVGs can actually, the SVG uh, elements or documents uh, also contain, Java, can also contain an embed JavaScript just like an HTML page or an HTML document would. Um, that has certain security implications. For example, would you allow JavaScript to run in an SVG icon on your desktop? No, of course not. There's, there's certain places where you can run it, certain places where you cannot. Um, it has things like color profiles, which you know, it's sort of a niche feature, but like for people doing print, it's really important. Um, on the web, it's sort of probably going to become more important once we get to uh, things like high dynamic range displays in, in the coming years. Now, how do you use SVGs? Well, I think a lot of you have probably uh, seen some of the common usage patterns, uh, just you know, replacing a ping file with, a, with an SVG, things like that. 
So let me run through some of the main, this is, this is not all of them, there's actually uh, an incredible amount, you know, variety of ways to use SVG. So I'm gonna run through some of the main ones. Um, one of my favorite ones is the HTML5 you know, native support for the SVG element. You don't have to do anything for it, you just open an element SVG and you can drop any kind of SVG uh, elements within that, any kind of shapes. Uh, and it, it can get really complicated, of course, but you can do simple things with that in your daily development. Uh, if you need to draw a line between something, you don't want to have to do hacks with border, uh, borders and all that kind of stuff. You can just draw a line in an SVG element. It takes you know, very little code to do that. Um, you no longer have to worry about namespaces and all these kind of things. And you know, it renders beautifully, it's high performant, uh, it's cleaner code. You can read the code and it means that there's an actual line there. It's no longer like a, somehow a div with a border bottom somewhere else defined in a CSS file. It's very clean, it, it works really well in large scale applications. Um, and I've really been uh, using that a lot lately. Um, so another way to do it that probably more people are familiar with right now is um, just loading in a URL function in, uh, in CSS. And these can be used in uh, a lot of places, like uh, background images, obviously. Uh, list style images, those little, those little glyphs in front of a, you know, an, a, like an ordered list, an, an, an ordered list. Uh, things like the border image, um, that's uh, something that you, know, you can do some neat tricks with. It's not the most uh, you know, high performance uh, in most browsers, but it works. Um, cursors, sort of flaky support right now, but again, not really concerned with that. Uh, and content, you know, like for uh, your, your, your pseudo elements, like your before and after, you can draw images within them, which is kind of neat. Um, SVG fonts, probably most of you have heard of them or seen them whenever you copy paste that, you know, that, 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 that um, some custom font from like Font Awesome or whatever service that you use. Um, SVG fonts are sort of deprecated. Um, but it looks like, and this is just looking at uh, you know, mailing lists and uh, discussions, there's a lot of interest in um, multicolor fonts. Um, I thought it was like, a bit weird at first, because why would you need multicolor fonts? But then, you know, emoji. Everybody loves sending emoji, emoticons. And those have gradients, those have shadows, there's a lot of colors. Um, and there's competing standards right now, so SVG is possibly making a comeback in, uh, in fonts. There's a lot of support in SVG, there's a lot of elements dedicated to you know, fonts and like uh, structuring a font in SVG. And most of those are right now sort of like brushed aside, but they, they might come back and when they do, we'll have things like colorful fonts, we'll have things, fonts with gradients within a single glyph, we'll have um, you know, shadows, we'll have, you know, it'll be beautiful scalable uh, imagery. Uh, the world will be awesome. So, that's sort of something that right now I you know, probably shouldn't be using, but in a, in a, in a couple of years, who knows. Um, another way to use them right now, which is it's actually really cool, it's a, it's a better way to do um, sprites. So if you're, doing, if, you, if you're combining a lot of small images into a larger uh, image, then you, know, it, you have to set up another build step, all this kind of stuff, and you have to deal with changing coordinates and, stuff, and things like that. It gets a little bit unwieldy sometimes. Um, it's it's a really a really nice way to do it is to just stack all of them in a single uh, SVG, and you can also you can again use a build, a build step for that. But it becomes really easy to actually manage that within um, your, your 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 SVG editors like Illustrator or, or uh, you know, um, Inkscape or something. Um, and the way to reference them is by just uh, using a URL like 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 these two here. The first one is how you actually reference um, SVG fragments inside your SVG files. So if you're embedding uh, like inline SVG in your document, you can use uh, the, the use element with a, this xlink href. It's, it's not the prettiest thing, but it works. Um, and you can reference your file and then do a, um, a fragment identifier in the URL. And that will pull up the ID, like the element with the ID that you specify, like Fox in this case. It will pull up the Fox uh, element and render only that. It won't render anything else. So you could have 100 uh, icons in there and it will just pick up that single, um, uh, that single uh, element. Uh, it's a really nice way to do um, sort of icon sheets or icon stacks or whatever you call them. Uh, 
It also works in um, image source in your regular HTML. So in this case, I would pick the same file, but pick a different element, and I would not see the fox, and I would not see the rabbit in the other one. Um, I think it also works in the background image. Uh, sorry, I didn't check that right now. So let's let's look, have a quick look. I'm, I'm sure you know probably uh, some of you have already seen you know what H, uh, SVG looks like, what you can do with it at the basic level. So I'll just uh, quickly skip through this. So the basic building blocks of SVG are um, really, you know, like in CSS, you have your units. They're actually exactly the same. In fact, the SVG specification says, you know, our units are basically the same ones as defined in CSS 2.1, the old stuff. So, but it hasn't really changed that much to 3 anyway. Uh, and I'm talking about CS, uh, SVG 1.1, which is pretty old, but it's, it's sort of what everyone uses today. Um, the basic uh, shapes are um, sort of simple ways to define common geometric shapes. So if you want to do a rectangle, you can make it you know, any size you want. Uh, you can um, give it a rounded, you know, like a little border radius uh, sort of thing. It's not as powerful as, like, for example, the border radius in CSS, where you can do uh, crazy things with like borders, you know, borders that sort of have different slopes on the, the vertical and the horizontal ones, and every corner can be different. Uh, it's very limited in, in SVG, but most of the times you just want to do a simple shape anyway, and it get, you can do that. The complex ones you can also do but it requires a little bit more uh, manual work. Usually you want to do that with, uh, again, like an editor. Like, uh, anyway, so there's other shapes, like ellipses and uh, circles. Uh, you can do lines, and polylines are like that little, uh, that little lightning. You can uh, just put coordinates, and it, it's, it's pretty easy to, uh, to do this manually even. You don't need uh, an editor. It's, you know, it's relatively straightforward. You know, I, I won't go through all the syntax. You can just look it up in a reference. Um, polygons, et cetera. Um, the last one is more like a, like a path, actually. So paths, uh, and, you know, it's not that important right now, but paths, you can do things like lines, arcs, busier curves, however, however you pronounce that, quadratic curves. Basically, cute little geometric shapes. Um, they are a pain to do manually, I'll tell you. So it uses a weird text-based uh, drawing instructions thing where you move to a point and then you draw to another point and you have control points. And it's impossible to do these things in your head. Uh, so basically copy-paste from like Sketch, Illustrator, Inkscape, or whatever. Um, so that's, that's the basic fundamental um, you know, drawing shapes kind of stuff. If you want to um, reference bitmap images or other SVGs, there's uh, an image element, which is not IMG, but image, the full word, uh, again, with that X-Link href. And um, you know, it supports any uh, file format that, um, that, your, that your browser would, would otherwise render. Um, you can also base64 you know, base encode them in a URL. So this is, again, stuff that we're all used to. Um, it makes it very, very convenient to nest other images in your image and reference them, reuse them, you know, leverage the whole caching that we have with HDFP. Uh, it's a nice way to um, basically have documents that reference other documents, which is something that you cannot really do with any other um, image format like, um, like Ping or JPEG. Um, it's a, it's a, it's, it can be a really powerful feature when, when used appropriately. Um, there's a lot of other stuff which you know, I don't have you know, nearly enough time to, to cover right now. Uh, you could probably do an entire hour-long talk about each of these things. It's a, they're, they're amazingly powerful. Um, you, know, you can group all kinds of elements and then treat them as one and two transformations on top of them. It's really cool. Uh, patterns, again, um, you know, transformations. Right? We're not going to get into all of that, so let's just get, go ahead. Uh, the SVG DOM, okay, is something where I'm really excited because you know we're, we're at CSS Conf, but there's also JS Conf tomorrow, um, and the, the DOM is really how you make things interactive in HTML, and almost the exact same methods apply to SVG. So if you're building an application um, in HTML, you might as well just do it in SVG and say you know we've got all these beautiful shapes and lines and connecting things. A lot of times when you're doing data visualization. Uh, don't bother with, with HTML and trying to mock things up with you know, fake elements all over the place and containers and left and right. Just use SVG straight away. Uh, JavaScript makes it really easy to deal with. Um, you do have to worry about namespaces because XML. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not too biased against uh, XML. Uh, I've done a, I, I, I think it's uh, actually not too big of a deal. Uh, one, you can easily uh, work around it, write a couple of uh, helper functions that deal with this. Because uh, basically, it's the same uh, code. So you create element, set attribute, you're, you know, 
get element, um, except you have to specify a namespace, which is just a little string that you have to uh, supply. It, 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 it can sometimes make it a little bit tricky, like, you know, why, why is this element not showing up? It's because my browser doesn't recognize it. It thinks it's an HTML element, but actually it should be an SVG element. And it gets a little bit weird sometimes, but you know, just keep it in mind. Um, to help you with that stuff, you can also use uh, a number of libraries. Here are some of the uh, common ones. Um, there's, a, there's a queue that's a green sock. It's really cool. I've been using it for um, uh, some, some pretty heavy front end uh, animated, animated uh, stuff where you know, I'm dealing with canvases that are um, you know, like hundreds of thousands of pixels squared and the performance of this stuff is amazing. Um, you want to use, you probably want to use one of these wrappers um, because things like transformations in SVG are a pain um, when, you, when, you, when you're coming from CSS uh, simply because the things like, things like the, the transform origin are a little bit different. They're not in the center, they're in the corner. Uh, and it just can, it can get really confusing. And these, 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 uh, these APIs, they sort of like pave over all of that inconsistency, um, as well as help you with some of the, the, the shortcomings that browsers still have today. So you know, have a, have a look at these. Um, there's Raphael, there's uh, Snap SVG, there's SVG JS and GSAP, the green sock animation. Um, so like I said earlier, you know, the future of the web is probably gonna be web components, right? But, um, I don't know how many of you have already been uh, playing with this. Uh, I, 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 I find it amazing um, that these things are now in the browser. And if you look at things like Polymer, if you look at XTag, um, they just work. It's amazing. You don't really, um, you, know, you get a lot more flexibility in how you structure your application, which allows us to reuse a lot more code, which allows us to build more advanced software in less time or the same time. Um, and what you, what you can now do is create your own elements in HTML. You can do the same thing in SVG. And uh, the way it works is not really, um, right now we're working with things like Polymer, but if you, if you, do, if you, just, if you code it with uh, the, the standard API yourself, um, this actually works in the browser. You can test this out. Um, and then you can extend the behavior of elements, basically making your view just an element that you can invoke um, uh, anywhere you want in the application. Um, so, for example, what I'm creating here, when I'm registering this element here, I could then instantiate that. I could assign, I, I could, I could, I could um, attach custom behavior to it. It would inherit from, in this case, uh, an SVG circle. Uh, I could make that an interactive circle. I could attach, uh, automatically inject all the event um, handlers that um, you know, monitor uh, touch input, uh, mouse input, um, and you know, it sort of lets you neatly wrap uh, a lot of your functionality. So. Again, this is not about web components, but I think that it's amazing that we can do this across HTML as well as uh, SVG, and again shows the, the, you know, the, the power that uh, SVG has in uh, joining our stack as front-end developers, the potential there. Um, so not just HTML works with SVG, we can also do the same with uh, CSS. Um, it's, it's what you use to basically uh, give markup, and there's, there's a lot of different ways to, uh, to do that with, uh, with uh, CSS in SVG. So here's some of the common ones. There's a lot of other ways as well, but sort of the, um, the main ways of doing it, especially when you're doing inline SVG in your document, which is why I, uh, it's so preferred, um, is to actually have your CSS referenced like you would normally have it in your HTML page, in your HTML document, sorry. Um, and it can actually uh, use set selectors in your, in your CSS that um, target things inside the SVG document because it's embedded. Uh, it becomes you know, very straightforward for everyone on the team to understand. Um, it becomes, you, know, you use the same modularization approach that you, that you would for, for the other views in your application and now applies to SVG elements. Uh, it's very seamless. Um, you can also uh, put you know, things like inline uh, CSS on your SVG elements directly, but again, just like we don't do that with SVG, at least we hope, I hope we don't do that, uh, sorry, with HTML, you again probably shouldn't be doing a whole lot of uh, CSS in line in SVG, just like you would in HTML. Um, there's a, as you might see here, there's, a, there's some new properties in SVG, or different properties in SVG. Uh, there's also certain properties that don't really work. I'm not gonna go through an entire list. Uh, there's plenty of resources available online. Um, basically, Whenever you draw a line or a shape, 
you, you use things like stroke, you set a width on that stroke, you can fill that shape. Um, these are very straightforward concepts. You can do things more like more advanced with patterns that you just flood the whole thing with a, with a, with a texture or with, with some kind of uh, other, you know, other designs. Uh, these are things that aren't really there in CSS. Uh, they, they make they make uh, a lot more you know, a lot of designs that, that suddenly become possible and, and, and downright easy that would otherwise be really hard to pull off in, uh, in, in plain CSS and HTML. Um, so yeah, there's other ways like you know you can pull in external style sheets directly into your SVG, which is kind of convenient when you have a standalone SVG file. Um, what you can do is use uh, the XML style sheet um, uh, instruction to actually load a CSS file. It's slightly different from what you would you know, what you would do with a, a link tag in HTML, but it works just the same. It, again, allows you to separate all your design from your structure. Uh, it allows you to you know leverage caching again as well. So all the same benefits that were used to exist in SVG. Uh, and I'll run through maybe a couple of couple of things that I came across and that were surprising to me in, uh, in my experience using SVG in my web applications. Um, there's, there's things that are really strange at first. For example, the, the view box. Now, it, this, is one, this is one of those things that you sort of have to, you know, you have to grok it before SVG starts to make sense, before you can actually think SVG. Um, the view box is an attribute on the SVG element where you determine, like, where you, where you can specify which part of the, you know, the, the sort of SVG canvas will show up when you embed that SVG in your, uh, in your, in your content? Um, it's, it's kind of interesting to think about that you could actually do a crop and a transform. Um, essentially, if you look at the screenshot, the, uh, the, 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 the measuring, uh, the, the rulers there show the entire uh, document, the SVG uh, document. Basically called a canvas as well. It's a little confusing. Um, and the orange box is what gets shown where this SVG will be embedded. So, the, like for example, the eyes and most of the beak uh, of this bird would not appear when this element is embedded. Um, but you can easily change uh, which part gets shown. The other thing about the view box is that you can stretch and scale. Um, Without having to touch all the coordinates in your uh, in, in, in your um, geometric shapes, um, in this case, if you look at the, the view box attribute, and by the way, it's case sensitive. It's kind of painful because jQuery doesn't really like that very much, um, and a lot of other tools also kind of uh, have issues with that with case sensitive attributes. But so you have 100, 100, 200, 150. Now 100, 100 is your translation, which means that. If you, have an if you have a use case where you want to pan across uh, uh, an SVG, an image, uh, you can use those first two um, values to move the view box over your image without touching any of the image uh, elements and any of the children's coordinates. Um, this is one of those things where I feel like that didn't really belong in view box, but they put it there anyway. And it's there now, and you know, usually you just leave them at zero, zero and just deal with the view box that starts at the origin point in you know, where, it, where it belongs, essentially. Um, the 200, 150, you know, obviously, is um, the size of the view box. But the tricky bit about that is that size is sort of, um, well, it's, a little, it's a little bit more complicated. But basically, there's no units on it. And what that means is that you can specify, you know, you don't have to worry, is this a pixel? Is this a, an EM? Is this a, P, a point? Is it a pika? Um, you can use. You, you don't have to worry about units. They're all called user units, essentially, in, in the user coordinate system and all kind of stuff. Um, they get scaled to whatever you set as the width or height. Now, the width or height are optional. So what that means is you can create your L, your, your SVG content um, independent of where it's going to show, how large it's going to be. But you can still use the simplicity of calculating as sort of a virtual pixels. Um, so you can specify content that's you know 175 and, and 25, um, and just you you just look at that 200 as your total size, and that will scale perfectly wherever that's being used, wherever that SVG will end up being embedded. And as you change the size of the width and, and the height, for example, if, if I were to change that to percent, 100 uh, percent, 
uh, with, it would scale perfectly. It's it very easy to make it uh, responsive and it scales perfectly. Something really hard to do with HTML. You know, for, imagine if you had to uh, scale an HTML element and all the children automatically. You have to, you know, I think later on in the day there will be some talks about that. But uh, things like Flexbox. But um, with SVG, it's extremely easy to do this. Um, so one issue with that is what happens when you scale them, but the aspect ratio is different from that of the view box. Um, you get sort of a funhouse mirror effect. That's what I was going for here. I hope I can do. Um, essentially, there's, there's another attribute in SVG called preserve aspect ratio. Um, amazing names. Uh, it's, it's got a really weird syntax that uh, I, don't, I haven't seen any, uh, you know, anything similar to that in, 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 um, in, in CSS. But it sort of works like your background size property in CSS. Um, not as powerful, but can be used to um, do similar things where you know, background size uh, it can do you know, stretching uh, a background image to contain or to cover, uh, and it will crop the image or it will uh, you know, letterbox um, the, the background image basically in an element. It's sort of the same way where if you, if you embed an SVG element, uh, inside, uh, let's say, an HTML uh, block, and your HTML block stretches really wide, um, you can then use preserve aspect ratio to, de to determine how, how it gets stretched or if it's squeezed or what happens to it. Um, there's, a, you know, there's a little image here, uh, just include this, you can find this online. Um, it's a really, you know, it's one of those things where once you get it, it just makes sense. And it's one of those things where well, when you're dealing with uh, responsive SVG, I always re ref you know, reference this uh, this, uh, this horrible image, because um, it just explains it every single time. Um, things like cover and contain become, in, in SVG, become meat and slice. Um, things like uh, aligning to uh, like the background position, where you stick, stick elements to the left, to the right, to the top, to the bottom, or in the, in the center. Uh, in here, they become x min, y min. Somehow x is lowercase and y is uppercase, I don't know. Uh, it's, 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 it just makes not, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, and it also doesn't allow you to do things like, you come, like, like you're used to in, uh, in, in CSS, where you can stick it all to, the, to, to, a, to one side and then offset it by a certain percentage or a number of pixels. You, know, you can do slightly, thing, slightly more powerful things in CSS, but this sort of works uh, in, in, in a lot of cases and gets the job done. You can always work around those, uh, those problems anyway. Um, one more thing that you should probably be aware of, that unlike HTML, uh, you have a limit to how big your, uh, your SVG uh, can render on the screen. So in, in HTML with CSS, you can, you, can have, you can set up, you know, an image that has a million, billion pixels, you know, uh, squared or whatever, and, and, it's, and it's fine. You know, the browser doesn't really care too much about that. It tiles the whole thing and, it, and you know, life goes on. With, with SVG, you know, uh, with SVG, things crash. With SVG, you can crash iOS. Uh, things run out of texture um, memory on, on the GPU. The drivers are buggy for those, those kind of things. And uh, you end up in a really bad situation really quickly. Um, it's sort of similar to what happens when you have extremely large JPEGs and, and ping files, other kind of images. The, what happens is that um, they don't get tiled as much as they get rendered into a texture on the GPU to make things faster. Um, the whole thing gets rasterized, uploaded into the GPU, and then things kind of, yeah, get limited very quickly. Um, what you need to do really is, I think, use that, what, what I've done anyway, is use that view box trick where you do a transform. You basically uh, constrain the, the, the size of the view box and use transform to sort of pan around if you really want to show other things. So you can, you can connect it to, uh, you know, with a little bit of JavaScript, you can connect it to your scrolling and your panning. And as you're, as you're moving around, you just update the view box. And things render, you know, uh, things update really quickly with SVG because it's all hardware accelerated anyway. Um, you get, like, like I say here, you get infinite resolution, which basically means using that same view box trick. You could specify a view, a view box that's a billion pixels wide, and then it gets scaled down to, you know, 100 pixels by 1,000 pixels or something. You get extreme precision but it doesn't really make a difference uh, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the limit on how many uh, pixels you can render to. That's basically limited by the operating system, by your graphics drivers. It varies from device to device. Uh, it varies from browser to browser. Um, 
it's, it, it can get a little tricky. I recommend keeping it under five megapixels. And that means uh, if you have one pixel height, you can do five, five, uh, five million pixels wide. Um, keep it something like the size, of the, the size of the screen is typically a good idea. Don't go beyond that. So you know, if you don't go beyond like a 4K panel at this point. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of small things uh, about optimizing SVGs. Because they're written, like you write you know, HTML, you have things like comments. Um, because of the way uh, tools output SVGs, when you're editing them, it might turn out into very, very verbose code, or you know, XML. Uh, and there's, there's a tool called SVGO, or SVGO, I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, it's got an uh, easy way to integrate it with your grunt and your gulp stack. Um, and it sort of you know, compresses it a little bit. Uh, most of the compression that you're going to get on SVGs is going to be from you know, gzip over HTTP. Um, it's, it's still going to be plain text, right? Um, but it sort of makes it a little bit better. Uh, you'd be surprised how, how bad some of the tools are at uh, outputting really, really verbose full comments that are totally useless. Uh, things like paths, it will string them together into a single path instead of having like as many sections as your designer was drawing them. Um, so you know, SVG optimizer is really nice to use for that. It's all automated, of course. And um, you know that I think that about covers it. But there's a couple of more things I wanted to share. Um, animation. I haven't really touched on it. Now with animation, you can do it in, in, in a variety of ways. So obviously you can use uh, CSS animations, right? We've already covered CSS in SVG. Um, certain properties cannot be animated right now, whereas they could be in uh, in HTML. Um, so instead, it might make more sense to use JavaScript, something like uh, those um, those those uh, wrappers, those API wrappers that I mentioned earlier. Uh, things like GSAP, I've been using it. It's really high performant. It makes it very easy. The code is exactly the same as you're used to in HTML. Um, you can then you can also use uh, SMIL or SMIL. How, how do you pronounce that? Um, it's actually the recommended way of doing animations in um, in SVG. It looks really nice uh, when you, you know, code it. And it. It's basically just another tag. It's the animate tag. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here. Again, it's, it's a whole topic of, topic of its own. Um, but uh, you know, it, it gets really good performance. It's the way forward. You know, and speaking of the way forward, um, we're going to have SVG2 pretty soon that shows that there's um, similar to, uh, that shows that there's a lot of promise and a lot of investment happening into SVG because I think people recognize that it is part of the future of front-end development. Um, there was an effort called SVG 1.2, and there was a whole bunch of stuff going on around SVG Tiny for mobile devices. You know, it turns out that mobile devices are as powerful as, you know, definitely more powerful than my uh, crappy laptop there. Um, and uh, that whole effort sort of got you know, rebooted and is now called SVG 2. And it's going to have you know, some improvements over uh, SVG 1.1, which is, like I said, the current one current version, um, but it's, it's, I think it's more about getting all these companies that are building our tools, that are all, all, and all of us who are using it, getting all these people organized in their community again to improve the standards that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I think that's really exciting. Uh, and I look forward to using more standards like SVG in, uh, in our applications to make better products for our users. Um, and I think with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you, Seth. Q&A, and we have one question. Uh, hello, do you suggest replacing all images on the website with SVG, or do you have certain ways to figure out which uh, images to change to SVG? Um, good question, good question. So there's going to be images that are you know, more suited to um, JPEG, Compression type of compression where you have lossy compression, right? Um, things like things that you would do with ping files a lot of times work better with SVG, uh, simply because you're, you're using ping actually for with uh, with with lossless compression. Um, when especially when there's a lot of geometric shapes, and that, that works perfectly with uh, SVG. And in fact, most of the times the tools that the designers use to create those images are in fact vector editors. Um, so you might as well output that straight away. Especially once you go looking at, you know, everything has to be retina assets for, you know, for uh, mobile devices.
classes and things like that, it makes a lot of sense to turn like, pretty much every ping file into an SVG. Uh, JPEGs, not really, uh, but you could still use them um, to do, to, you know, re like reference them from an SVG element uh, just to get access to things like filters, transformations again. Um, with, with filters, you can do blending modes, which basically means that you, could, you, you dive, dive a little bit deeper into the stack um, uh, and of, of how your images are composited. And if you, if you can take smaller, uh, you know, lo lossy compressed files and composite them using blending modes, uh, you might save a lot of space as well. Uh, you might be able to do a lot more cool effects with, uh, with those images using SVG again. All right, more questions. Hello. Um, so when you use normal pictures, they are all indexed by Google. Uh, to what degree are Google indexing SVG Im images? I think you'd have to ask Google that. I'm not, I'm not sure. I haven't done any tests on the SEO, I'm sorry. OK, sure, thanks. In theory, though, it, it shouldn't be impossible at all. It's basically the same. It's, it's just another uh, document that they could parse very easily. It might actually be a lot easier than doing single page apps, which you know, we're all doing anyway. So. Um, do you suggest a fallback solution to just in case browsers doesn't support SVG, so load in PNG or whatever? Um, what? So, if you're using something like Raphael, they go all crazy and they sort of replicate SVG using this thing called VML for Microsoft, which is like you know, a million years old. Um, you could do all of that. Um, there's also cases where you're using just SVG as a rendering backend, like for example with 3.js. Uh, but if you're building applications, it's really hard to do that. Uh, so, you have to consider your, your audience and you know, decide whether SVG is an appropriate solution today. Um, even if it isn't, I think it makes sense to look at it because in a couple of years, everyone will actually have support. And I think even if you look at caniuse.com today, SVG has amazing support in, in most, uh, most browsers and devices. I've been struggling with working with the SVG DOM, getting assets for the SVG DOM and manipulating them in JavaScript. Do you have any kind of workflow that you've used before to get those assets optimized and just for work with SVG DOM, how would you load it just in high level in general? Wait, do you mean uh, SVG assets or what kind of assets? Um, assets that you can just load up into SVG DOM inside your document and then manipulate, manipulate in JavaScript by creating SVG based applications. Okay, so. Um for example, if you're using uh, tools like Sketch, uh, Illustrator, they all export like the SVG paths. If you if you consider that an asset, right? So if, when you're doing you, when, you can, when you do animations, you can also do animations along a path. For example, um, you typically keep those in separate files, and I like to have build tools that again concatenate or in, inject uh, them according to IDs and then reference them by ID, which typically I map to a file name. But you know, these are just these are just my personal conventions. Um, it's an interesting question, I, and I'm sure as more people use them, use SVG, I think more of these patterns will become sort of commonplace. Um, I think right now it's, it's a very flexible, uh, you know, very fluid kind of scenario. So everyone's just testing it out. Happy to talk more about it as as I get more experience with it myself. Uh, hi, I'm just ask uh, another question about HTML5 canvas. So these like most most of the things you talk about SVG is kind of uh, can be done in HTML canvas and to me right the HTML canvas renders less elements in mean, just one DOM element for itself. So in, 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 in SVG you actually kind of create a lot of elements, especially when you do some kind of interactions, you add more elements inside. So the 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 I think the DOMs have to render a lot. So what do you think about that? As the canvas itself can be rendered as, a, as an image. So to me, it's rather, it's rather light. So what do you think about that? Very good question. The comparison of canvas versus SVG is, of course, relevant to a lot of uh, applications. Um, I think when you look at SVG, um, there's, you can look at it as there's content there. Um, sometimes you put like, a lot of data in your SVG. Um, and it's nice to be able to like, like be able to index it or be able to use other tools to access that data. Whereas if you render it all into a bitmap, it becomes really hard to do that. Um, there's also the 
all the geometric shapes, uh, the things like paths. Those are essentially just drawing instructions, which, you know, if you're going to draw them to a canvas, you, you still need to pass those instructions using JavaScript. Um, doing it again with uh, you know, SVG, they become a little bit more um, sort of normalized so that other tools can help optimize them and simplify those instructions. Uh, I don't think that Canvas has that much of an advantage in performance. And, you know, again, it varies from browser to browser. But um, I think the number of elements by itself is not really an important metric for performance at least. Um, and I think having more elements actually helps us in development um, because it gives you better insight into how was this uh, image constructed or how was this module constructed. Um, again, things like you know, being able to create your own custom elements. Uh, like I'm a huge fan of web components. Um, I, I think that's something that, that would be really you know, uh, hard to see happening with Canvas, for example. And so I, it's going to be difficult to, 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 to imagine uh, reusable, modular, in, you know, interoperable ways to create components for Canvas, just as, as we can do with uh, HTML and SVG. 